for those of you who don't know, we're, we're, you guys are sitting in the getting slizzard talk. So just brief agenda here, uh, where we're going to take you through um, during this talk. Um, go through some introductions, you know, about who we are. Go through a little bit of a primer um, on SSL. Talk about some um, mobile SSL user experiences, research motivations, research and Im implications. Talk a little bit about a test lab that we built. I'm going to introduce a tool for you guys, so the, the Slizzard tool. Um, show you some of the results of us testing some of the mobile apps and the mobile devices. And then there's going to be an audience participation. So real quick, who we are, um, I'm Nicholas Prococo. I'm the head of the Spider Labs team at Trustwave. Um, I started my InfoSec career in the 90s um, doing penetration testing. Um, this is my sixth DEF CON talk. I actually had two others this weekend. Um, one was Mail or Freak Show on Friday and then the, um, and then the Droid talk yesterday. I'm also the primary author of Trustwave's Global Security Report. And I'm Paul Kerr. I'm the lead SSL developer and the CA architect for Trustwave. Uh, and since I don't have a whole lot of other bio information I can put up here, so we decided to say also a mobile game developer in my spare time. And also sometimes at work, uh, if you're going to hosting con in the next few days, we're releasing a game there. So if we figure we'd hype it now, it went in the App Store this morning. I promise it's not malicious. <laughs> So be, before we start, um, we have some audience participation at the end of this presentation. Um, and so you're going to be able to help us find a, um, find a mobile SSL flaw. So what you'll need, so if you, if you have a mobile device, actually you could have any type of device it's, it has internet connectivity, 3G, 4G, if you're on the DEF CON network, um, you, you can help us out. Um, you have to have the ability to enter a URL in your mobile browser. And then you also have to trust that we're not going to be doing anything malicious to you. Um, and then willingness to stand up if your test is successful. So just to, for, just to gauge the audience, how many people here are willing to, willing to help out? OK, great. Cool. That's going to be fun. So let's jump into the, the introductions here. So what does this talk about? So basically, um, when we were talking about, you know, Paul and I were discussing sort of you know, planning for this talk and planning for the research, um, really we're discussing sort of the evolution of the security experience in mobile platforms. You know, obviously, when you have a large, giant screen, 27-inch screen in front of you, there's a lot of things you can do from a security standpoint, or even security warnings, messages, and other things that you could present to users. Um, but when you cram it down into a small little device, um, the, the space is limited. And also, the, the, the developers of the platforms um, tend to um, try to abstract some of the, the, the busy information that you may see on your desktop platforms, or we want to see on your desktop, pla desktop platforms um, from your device itself. We're also going to talk a little bit about you know, some different types of SSL attacks. Um, the lack of testing tools, uh, testing is t available for mobile applications, specifically for mobile app developers. Um, we're also going to talk about um, how various apps and devices perform under SSL stress. And so we, we did take some popular apps, ran them through some tests, and we're going to present you know, how, those actually, um, how those actually reacted. And then we're going to release a tool to help solve this problem. So very, very briefly, just you know, when I, whenever I give talks, I always want to make sure um, to, to, to start with a primer. Um, because I, 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 about 11 years ago, I sat in the audience um, at DEF CON and, and saw plenty of talks. And, and sometimes when I, when I was staring at the presenter, I was thinking, I don't have no idea what this guy's talking about. So I um, want to just you know, bring everybody up to speed. You know, and there could be some, some, some people in the audience who, who maybe aren't familiar with SSL. So basically, SSL stands for um, Secure Socket Layer. Um, it uses certificates, you know, digital files, which are certificates certificates defined by the X509 um, specification. It was actually developed by Netscape back in 1994 and was implemented in Netscape Navigator 1.0. Um, you know, my personal history, I remember when Netscape Navigator 1.0 was released, I was sitting in my dorm room and the day it was released, actually I think it was probably a couple hours after it was released, um, I went to a, a Netscape store and actually bought a t-shirt bought a um, with a credit card. Um, and it was my first experience with, with SSL and sending a secure transmission across the internet um, using that technology. Um, it's a protocol, you know, typically used to secure client-to-server com um, communication, um, data specifically. Most of you in this room interact with it every single day. Um, if, you, if you do anything online, logging into sites, um, if you're using you know, mobile devices and you're, you're, you're logging into your online banking account, wherever you may be doing. So you, you, most people have interaction with it. Some people may not be aware they're interacting with it. And then it uses, um, from, a, from a keen standpoint, a key standpoint, it uses asymmetric keys. Um, basically public and private keys um, to establish a symmetric key um, to, to s establish the, um, the, the secure transmission. So where are SSL, where is SSL used, specifically certs, um, we talked about to establish secure client to um, server communication. Um, it also is used to ide establish identity as well. And so when you visit a website, 
um, that a popular you know, you know, financial institution, you often will see sometimes even something like an extended validation um, indications like the green bar that will establish that you are in fact or you hopefully are in fact connecting to that, um, that, uh, that, that website that you think you're going to. Also used in app signing, so, so the same technology used to sign applications, um, specifically in, 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 the, in the mobile world as well. And then log file integrity. Um, lots of times you could actually sign, there's, there are tools out there that will sign your logs to ensure the integrity of those logs. They haven't been tampered with um, after the fact. And then very similar in the mobile world, um, used for um, communication over public networks. It's actually pretty important for, for security communication over public networks because we're all roaming around, um, you know, walking around at conferences, walking down the street, um, using our phones from untrusted networks such as you know, coffee shops and places like that. And when you submit data that you don't want anybody else to see, um, you want you, you to send it over the, over the public internet or even pu public local networks in, in, in an encrypted format. So it establishes app to server communication. Um, it's also used in app code signing, like, like we already talked about. And then it's also used in, in mobile device profiles. So um, you know, if, you, if you work for a corporate, uh, you work for a company and they push down profiles to your, to your, your iOS device, um, they'll actually, you know, actually sign those um, using, using SSL. So a little bit of a sort of cartoon drawing about what man in the middle is, and this is where we're going to you know, dive a little deeper into, into our talk. Um, basically, want to describe you know what is a man in the middle attack, and so you can see that diagram at the bottom, um, very very cartoon like. But you know, the bad guy sitting in the middle there of the diagram, the um, you or the the end user is sitting over on the um, over on the left hand side of the screen, and that's your mobile device. You're actually you know you, he's injected into your into your into your network somewhere. Um, so it may be on your your local WAN, um, could be somewhere in the path between you and um, the the place you want to visit, the legitimate place you want to go. And so basically, you establish your connection with the attacker, and the attacker then um, establishes a, a, a illegitimate connection to the backend server. So then, so when that's when that happens, the attacker is able to then intercept the data that you're sending, um, but also um, possibly modify that as well. So, what tools actually exist to help with man-in-the-middle attacks? Uh, there are quite a few. We've got uh, ThickNet, which is a man-in-the-middle framework developed by Steve Asepic, who is a member of the Trustwave Spider Labs team. It's written in Perl and is a modular system that allows you to uh, add extra um, functionality to it after you've set up your initial man-in-the-middle. Uh, there's EtherCap, which is kind of the gold standard uh, tool that everybody's familiar with, although it hasn't been developed in quite some time. It's still a very solid and very useful tool for doing this sort of thing. Uh, you can also use uh, more basic tools like ARP spoof that will just uh, spoof ARP, exactly what it sounds like, uh, to cause packets to be redirected to you and then you can use other tools to uh, parse and, uh, excuse me, inter intercept and uh, modify those packets. Um, specifically things of, such as SSL strip or SSL sniff. Uh, and then there's also things like man in the middle proxy which is just an SSL capable and intercepting HTTP, HTTP proxy. So why is true SSL man in the middle difficult? Well, SSL certificates have what's called a chain of trust. Uh, the X509 spec was based around the concept that you have roots or sometimes they're called trust anchors. Those roots are present in the certificate store of the device or application that you're attempting to use. Uh, so for example, you connect to facebook.com using your web browser. Your web browser is now chaining it, it, obt uh, it obtains the uh, SSL certificate and any intermediate certificates in the initial uh, handshake. And then it uses its own internal uh, methods to try and find a chain of trust up to a root CA that it's already familiar with. So you can't just go and sign your own certificate because it's not in there. And if you add it to your own, it's not in anybody else's. Um, and the reason for that is, of course, that well, we don't want you to be able to create www.facebook.com or api.facebook.com or any of those other certificates because why should you be the authoritative source for that? Now, there are certain other ways of trying to develop uh, more uh, distributed networks of trust, but for the moment, X509 is based upon the concept that there are trust anchors. So now that we've established that you need a public CA for that, you now need to find some way to attack a public CA. Now, as proven in the past by Moxie and others, you can attack public CAs. However, it's typically not particularly practical. Uh, you need to take, you need to focus on one specific one. You may need to spend quite a bit of time, and you may not be successful in the first place. Uh, social engineering usually plays a fairly large component in it, rather than technical flaw. Um, so then you may want to generate malform certs. Well, the tooling around generating certificates is pretty streamlined these days. 
And because the ASN1 spec, which is what X509 X509 utilizes, is so complex, they actually lock it down pretty heavily in almost all the tooling. Uh, it's so easy to go wrong. So you actually have to go down and play down in the libssl, openssl layers, or use something like the uh, Ruby openssl bindings to be able to generate malformed ASN1 structures. So that's, that's a, usually an obstacle for people who aren't familiar with uh, that kind of type of code. And then SSL parsing zero days are difficult to come by. Um, as Moxie's demonstration of null character attacks worked, he managed to find both a flaw in the way CAs were validating certificates and a parsing error in the uh, in actual mul multiple different uh, parsing engines, because so that, that flaw actually affected Firefox and the uh, IE S channel validation routines. So we'll talk a little bit about mobile SSL experience from a user perspective. So obviously there's no standard UI. Um, if, you know, if you have an Android device, you have an iOS device or WebOS, whatever you have, um, there's no real standard for um, letting the end user know that they've established a, a secure connection. So you've established an SSL connection. Um, most applications show nothing at all. Uh, you know, fire up your, your, your online banking app and um, you, you just have to you just assume that maybe it's being sent, in, sent, sent over SSL, but it could be being sent over in the clear. You have no, there's no indication um, from an end user's experience uh, of the difference. Um, in, in most cases, not, you know, like I said, there's no UI at all. There's no, there's no lock that you see in a, browse, in a, in a browser experience. Um, it's just basically, you know, it's basically non-existent. Um, there, are, there are things like that in, in some of the mobile browsers themselves, um, but just because you see a lock there, um, you have no ability to drill down deeper to actually check into the, um, check out the certificates that are, that are being presented to you. And then, of course, there's cryptic warnings. Um, in some part of our research, we had, you know, when we were doing some of the testing, um, we noticed a lot of cryptic warnings. Some warnings just didn't even make sense um, for what was going on in, in, in the testing. And then users don't know the difference. So you know, you, you know, everybody in this room, you know, being security aware, um, you know, would know the difference, um, but, um, but most end users wouldn't, and they wouldn't know um, if, if, if they established a connection or if they didn't. They wouldn't even know to look. And then the pop-up could be lying. And so there's, so there's a, the photo you see, or the, the screenshot you see there was from an app um, that I actually um, went and downloaded. It's, it's, a, it's an app to find um, sort of you know, boutique hotels when you travel around that are, that are cheaper, but, um, but maybe a little nicer than chains. And so um, when I was using that app, I noticed there was a lock in the corner. Um, and it says um, secured by, and it has trust click on it. Um, you, you put your finger on that lock, and a pop-up box comes up that says secure booking powered by travel click and protected by 256. Um, bit SSL encryption. So that could be just complete bullshit. You, know, you have no idea um, if, if that pop-up is lying. So the browser community has now spent almost two decades tweaking their UI behavior when it comes to SSL. I mean, originally you had locks, padlocks in the corners, and you've had padlocks move up next to the uh, URL bar. You've had yellow, you've had green, you've had just white. Um, you've had green locks that actually don't represent EV security. The point is that there is always a presentation, even if that presentation has been changing. So there's ways for you to both look at and validate what you're seeing. However, the mobile device market, in, in essence, destroyed that within five, in less than five years. It went from at least something to see to you need to trust that something good is happening. When you open up your mobile app to connect to Google Plus or Facebook or whatever your social network is, you just assume that it's using SSL you have no way to tell. So that's obviously something of a problem. And you can't expect to see, uh, excuse me. So if F SSL fails silently on that front, well, the world probably doesn't end, but maybe your personal world does. So some of the research motivations as well, you know, you know, most apps completely ignore the UI aspect of security. So that's something we wanted to look into. You know, like, like, like Paul already mentioned, but from, a, from the end user standpoint, or even from a developer standpoint, you know, you're, you're a mobile app developer, there is, from, there is a zero functionality difference between sending data in the clear and sending data encrypted. So there's no real no motivation other, other than the protection of the data that's being sent for them to implement it. And so as an end user, you just have to trust that when you're sending some things like credentials or bank account information or credit card information via an app, that the developer care, cares enough about you to, to actually establish that SSL session and, and encrypt your data. And we also, we also thought there wasn't really any tools, any, any, an easy set of tools for people to, to run, run their apps through these types of tests. And then also, you know, when you find OS level problems, the, they cascade to all apps. 
uh, where they can cascade to all apps. So if there's an OS level um, you know, SSL parsing problem, um, it, could, it could affect every single app on a device, um, not, just the, not just the ones that are, not, not, just the one, not just one single app. And to be fair, that is true of desktop as well, but uh, on the mobile side, much more so than the desktop side, people tend to use consistent APIs that go down to the OS hooks. So, for example, on the desktop, uh, you could have several different uh, libraries that are actually handling your SSL validation routines. Um, if you're using Firefox, it uses uh, its own, NSS specifically. And if you're using Safari or Chrome or uh, uh, Internet Explorer or whatever, then you're using S Channel or the OS level libraries for OS X. However, on the, excuse me, on, the, on the mobile side, you're emphatically, unless you've chosen to go a route that very few do, you're using the OS level uh, libraries for handling that. So whenever you're, whenever you're doing security research, there's always the implications of your research. And obviously, you know, something that, that we talk about today um, could be used by someone to do something, you know, used to do bad things um, tomorrow. Um, and basically, you know, due to attackers really focusing on the um, mobile app um, world and the mobile device world, obviously the results of our research can, can be used for, like I said, to do bad things. Um, specifically, um, if there's problems with SSL, um, they can be used for credential stealing, data interception, even, even response manipulation um, back, to the, back, back to the client application. But the other, the other thing to, to think about is the, uh, these types of attacks um, will go unnoticed, um, and specifically if um, there's a lack of user awareness. You know, users, users aren't aware, even when they see error messages, if they just click through them, um, that's, that, that, that's, that's a problem as well. And then, of course, the lack of Q UI cues within the apps um, compound that. Um, so like what we talked about earlier, if the SSL fails and it fails silently, um, the users are the user just basically um, you know, blindly submitting their data um, through, the, through the networks and, 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 and being intercepted by attackers. So how do you actually build a test lab then? Um, well, there's a lot of ways, obviously, but one of the simplest and cheapest ways is just go ahead and get yourself a cheap Soho switch or switch and router like a WRT54GL or something and that typically you'd like it to be able to run a third party firmware like Tomato or DDWRT. Um, you want to want an attacker system. In our case we uh, went ahead and used Linux because it's much easier to compile lighter cap there than anywhere else. Uh, and we went ahead and also added a patch to it that we'll be discussing in a little bit. And then you need some victim clients. In our case we uh, have a Nexus S that was running at the time the latest version of uh, Gingerbread and an iPod Touch uh, fourth generation, which was running iOS 4.3.3. So what types of search do you need then once you've got that all set up? Uh, you're going to want ones that are valid for the target domain, of course, so you can validate that it works in the primary use case. Uh, you're also going to want as many malformed SSL certificate types as you can come up with. Um, Self-sign, which is a common one that many people deal with. Uh, CRLF, which is a uh, carriage return line feed. Um, that's actually something that in the past various libraries have had trouble with. Uh, you feed a carriage return line feed inside the domain or wrapping domains and sometimes it will parse before or after the CRLF. Sometimes it will just break and return true. Um, now that hasn't always been, that hasn't, it shouldn't be true now but that doesn't mean it isn't. Uh, then the null prefix, which of course was uh, one of Moxie's big ones recently which we discussed earlier. Um, invalid ASN1 structures where you can write fuzzers where you can say I want to have various you know, broken loops and, um, and uh, misnested forms inside my ASN1 structures. And then uh, broken encodings in general where you can uh, push UTF-8 into um, uh, BMP strings and things of like that because ASN1 has uh, type identifiers so you can play around with that. And then uh, things like the basic constraints and key usage and extended key usage extensions. Uh, every certificate has things encoded in it that set, tell the uh, browser or the OS what it should allow that cert to do. For instance, you, uh, when you have, are using a regular server certificate, it has an extended key usage called uh, server auth. And when you're using it for client authentication, it has one called client auth. And server auth certs can't be used for client auth and vice versa. And uh, in the basic constraints extension, there's typically a, a field that says, CA colon false, which means it's not a CA, don't let anybody sign things. <laughs> so then you need a method, of course, to generate the above easily. So what we went ahead and did was wrote a Ruby script called Slizzard that's an open source toolkit to easily generate multiple types of invalid certs for any given domain. Uh, the output can then be used with Ettercap to uh, run these attacks against your apps or others uh, to uh, see if these things are vulnerable. 
Uh, we've successfully attempted, uh, tested with EdderCap, and we have a patch on the DEF CON 19 DVD that you can apply against any standard EdderCap 073NG uh, tree, which will allow you to add a new flag, if, again, documented in the patch. But uh, you, you pass dash X that allows you to pass any certificate in. Uh, normally, EdderCap generates standard, uh, excuse me, st standard self signed certificates on the fly. Uh, and since we want to be able to pro provide different forms of broken certificates, we need uh, you use the flag to supply them. There's also a ThickNet module being developed by Steve Osepic. Um, I believe that will be delayed a little bit, but yeah, Steve's doing a talk. I think the next hour um, called Blinky Lights, and so when when that talk got accepted, um, it delayed his his man in the middle um, or his ThickNet module a little bit. But he's gonna he's gonna put that out shortly after our talk. All right. And this setup can be used against any OS application browser. Anything. I mean, as long as it's connected to the network that you've developed, you can man in the middle it. So, to use it, all you have to do is run it. <laughs> you can either specify it on the command line, or, or it, it will have an interactive uh, shell for specifying as well. So, and I guess we can do the demo. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, the the real motivation here was to, to develop um, this toolkit so that um, app developers. Specifically, app developers that they may be using their own libraries to um, their own routines to validate SSL in their applications. And this will be a, a surprisingly short demo since it does exactly what you'd expect. You specify the domain you want it to, spe to uh, generate certificates for, and they are generated. So now we can say, let's take a look at one. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the null character attack one. So as you can see, it generated for domain.com with a null character. OpenSSL is actually capable of detecting and reparsing null characters such that you can see it. But uh, in certain uh, other tools, you may not see the null character because it's a null character and unprintable. Uh, but that's the kind of thing we, we're going ahead and generating. And then you have a single key that corresponds to all these certificates. And in the, um, and in the editor cap, and so once you apply the patch, um, you actually can specify the, um, specify the, the certs to use right. um, for your test. As you can see there. So you go ahead and execute it, generate your certs, uh, set up better cap using the dash x flag to specify the cert type you want to test. And then you'll use your app as normal and see if you get error messages. If you don't get errors, then you should ch uh, check editor cap, which you can tell it, you can either have it outputting data uh, to the screen or you can have it writing to a PCAP file for later analysis using something like Wireshark. Uh, th that'll let you see if the data was intercepted as you expected. Uh, you'll have to execute editor cap once per cert type generated by Slizzard to gen uh, comprehensively test it. Uh, we don't allow dynamic switching at the moment, although we have been looking into improving the patch. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the um, mobile app test results. And so like we mentioned earlier about um, setting up the test lab, um, we actually set up the test lab, we had the various devices, and then we um, proceeded to basically man in the middle um, each of those devices and some popular apps. And so, um, you know, you want to? Sure. So on Android, as you can see, in, in a lot of ways, we didn't find a whole lot. Uh, we ran through several hundred tests, actually, across the ASN1 fuzzers and a very, various other ones. And you can see that the self-sign, uh, CRLF, null character, and ASN1s all fail closed. Uh, in the browser, you get the, what you'd expect, which is the invalid certificate notification, in which in Android, you can also actually click the view certificate and see a little bit of the details. You can't see why the chain might not be working, but you can see the end entity certificate itself. Um, some of the more interesting things around it were that when you do these types of attacks, some of the underlying OS libraries are getting upset because the Facebook app will, for example, completely stop responding. Uh, quitting it, reopening it doesn't seem to help. You actually have to reboot the entire phone sometimes. Um, However, and then there's the other thing we'll get was confusing error messages. Uh, none of them said bad SSL certificate. They would say things like no network connection or um, you know, server busy or er basically fallback error messages that just assumed that there couldn't be a problem with the SSL cert. It was something else. Uh, so that, that, was always, that was a little bit of an interesting uh, revelation for us. So we also tested iOS based on the same exact fashion. Um, and, and, and so I mean, I guess the big takeaway here, you know, you can see the same, same keys. If you can't really see it from the back of the room, um, the key basically, FC, the green FC means it fell closed, it did what it should. 
um, use, UR means user request, so basically something popped up and asked the user to do something and then failed open. So you know, obviously this was a little bit disappointing at, at this stage in the, in the research that we, you know, we didn't find anything, um, but there was also some, some confusing error messages as well that we noted. Um, and then one thing to note, um, Twitter, the Twitter client, um, actually had very nice accurate error messages. I think of all, all those apps that we, we tested was the only one that actually accurately displayed what, what the issue was that was being presented to the, to the end user. So now we're going to crowds. You have a question? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that's, that, that's interesting. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, basically, when, once you, um, when you went to the sign up screen using the fa Facebook app, um, we noticed that every, all data was being trans transmitted over HTTP. Yeah, it takes you to a custom web view, which just loads the m.facebook.com page, which is not over SSL. And everything, including the sign up uh, form, posts over HTTP for s some reason. <laughs> Yeah, the app yes. does that whether or not you're man in the middle. Yeah. That was just a little side thing we found. <laughs> so now we're going to do the, the audience participation. So, so what are we going to do? We're going to test for a specific SSL flaw um, by audience members. So we need as many people as possible to test this. So hopefully we'll, we'll find some vulnerable devices out there. Um, you're going to be shown a URL on the next slide. Um, if you see a certificate error um, when, you, when you visit that, don't do anything. We don't need to know um, that you got that error. But if you see a Spider Labs logo, and we'll show you what that looks like, um, we'd like you to stand up. So what we're not going to do, we're not, we're not pushing anything malicious to your device. So yeah, I guess you have to trust us with that. Um, and we're not exploiting any known, known or unknown browser flaws. So this is, this is an SSL negotiation test. That's specifically what it is. And in fact, we don't actually even have any JavaScript on that page. It's pure CSS and HTML. So a little bit, a little bit about what we're going to test. Um, uh, so basically, if you take the Wayback you know, way machine, you jump in the time machine, go back to 2002, Moxie actually published a serious Microsoft Internet Explorer vulnerability. Um, it was basically related to SSL validation checking. Yeah, th I mean, this flaw happens when a client fails to validate the signer as a valid CA. Uh, it allows a SSL negotiation to occur and complete because from its perspective, it found a chain. Um, so chains are actually, again, uh, unrelated to whether or not the cert is allowed to be a signing CA. Uh, that's all in the basic constraints parameter. So if something fails to check that it should or should not be capable of signing and it's just assumed to be capable of signing, that you could sign a certificate underneath your own personal website for some other website and then just pass that as an intermediate and it will validate. Uh, so that was what Moxie found at the time. Yeah, so we take us to the present day. Um, if, if we have a device or we found a device during our research um, that this was successful, it's basically complete you know, SSL failure. So basically SSL man in the middle, completely possible, whether, it's, whether a device or an, or an app is operating on a, on a, on a, on a public network. Um, so today at DEF CON 19, we're going to go through and actually see if this exists on any mobile platforms in the audience. So do you want to explain what we did to set the sure. steps up? So what we did is we requested a cert from a public CA for a meaningless domain, um, and specifically in this case we, are, we used a cert that I personally have for my own blog. Uh, then we used that certificate in Slizzard to generate and sign a new certificate in private key just underneath it. So basically we treated that end entity certificate as a sub CA. Uh, and then we installed the resulting certificate and key on test server and passed the uh, meaningless domain cert as the intermediate. So the correct behavior when visiting this test server is a certificate error. It just shouldn't work. Yeah. So let's do the test. So everybody in the room, if you can visit ssltest.spiderlabs.com, and, and then if you, if you see this logo on your screen without having to click through anything, please stand up. And you, you want to do it as well with the audience? Sure. So I'll go ahead and just uh, take a look at it myself here. Oh, oh, sure. Sorry about sorry. that, guys. Sorry. It is um, ssltest.spiderlabs.com. So if you, see the, if you see the logo, please stand up. Huh? Okay. So you want to do it as well as show what the audience sure. what it looks, what it looks like? Sure. got it here. Can you please keep, st keep standing? 
So this is what this is what you should see if if you're if you are vulnerable to this attack. Uh, you should not see a security warning at all. Yeah, if you see a security warning, that means your your phone is not vulnerable to this attack. It's not working at all. You get the error on the BlackBerry. Yeah, that's good. But you should. Okay. Let's go back into the. So sure. it's, so we'll explain a little more here. So the, sort of the problem here. So. So thanks everybody. I guess you can sit back down as well. Wait, yeah. actually, one oh, question. You while, you, while you're standing up. Oh. Yeah. Does, does anybody not using an iOS device? Who did get man in the middle? We have someone back there. Okay, if you can see us after the talk. We'd love to talk to you. <laughs> Yeah, so actually, yeah, so what is your device, sir? That runs iOS. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. Oh, he, we have one here. Oh. Interesting. Yeah, if you could see us after the talk, that would be, be great. It was a Samsung Rogue, he said. Yeah. That is an Android device. Yeah, so <laughs> let's, well, if you could see us after the talk, we'd be interested to talk to you. So. So basically, you know, anybody using um, anything less than f iOS 4.3.5, so if people are aware, um, Apple just pushed out a, a patch about a week ago, a little, right. you know, eight, nine days ago, um, that specifically addressed this issue. Yeah, I, and it's uh, just for those of you who might be on Verizon, it's 4.2.10 is the uh, patch version that fixes it. And, and this patch was solely pushed out to fix only this bug. There were no other fixes out there because of the severity of the issue. Yeah, from the, from the time frame, you know, Apple did a great job. It was 10 days after we reported this problem to Apple um, that they actually patched and pushed out the, the, the newest release. Um, so what we show here in the results here, so the basic constraints test, um, browser, Facebook, Mint, Foursquare, and Twitter um, all, all failed open. And so what that means is that we were able to establish complete um, man in the middle via SSL and intercept all the traffic um, that was being sent from the, from the, from the client device um, to the server. And then a little side note here, we, we estimate the iOS user's exposure. So the people who stood up are still exposed and are still vulnerable to this attack. Um, basically, it was about 18 months. Um, everything since at least um, 3.1.3. Right. And since uh, Apple tends to end of life after about two years, each uh, iPhone, for, uh, they, they're no longer eligible for updates, security or otherwise. 3.1.3 was the last version for the original iPhone. 4.1 something was the last version available for the iPhone 3G. So only 3GS and iPhone 4 are actually eligible to not be vulnerable. So, so I guess to note to the people who are st were standing <laughs> in this room, um, all of you, um, whether you're on the DEF CON network or you're or anyplace else, um, could be man in the middle um, via this method. And, um, and we probably recommend at this point you put your phone in airplane mode. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Apple patch fixes the underlying library, so it fixes it for browser and apps and everything else. Hmm. So uh, after our iOS disclosure, uh, Moxie was pretty tickled about the fact that one of his bugs had come back around. And so he released an updated version of SSL Sniff that will uh, fingerprint and do this to uh, any device that you've got on your network. Uh, Eric Monty, one of our TrustWave Spider Labs guys, has developed a workaround for iOS developers who want their app to work on earlier versions and not rely on iOS to the validation checking. Um, we're going to be posting a blog post about that right after the talks for people who want to incorporate, incorporate this code snippet. Um, we'd love more eyeballs on it because, quite frankly, we're not sure why it works, but it does seem to. I mean, the, the one big implication there, so say you are a financial institution and you have, um, you have online banking customers who are using a banking app from an iOS device. Um, if, they're, if those customers are not patched, that means that all the customers in, in your ecosystem that are not using this latest version um, are now vulnerable. So, um, so, so iOS developers may want to implement this, um, or the, basically that banking application developer may want to implement this to make it, to, to, to fix it um, re retroactively in, in older devices. Right. And then just recently, uh Hubert or Hubert or whatever his name might be, he's goes solely by this alias, released a tool called iSniff, which also does is SSL man in the middle using four, less than, uh, iOS less than 4.3.5. Um, so you can check that out on GitHub as well. Yeah. 
So, so conclude, I guess just to conclude here, um, you know, the, the basic, basic takeaway is that we, we need more eyes um, on, this, on this type of technology, on, on, on this testing. So we want, that's why we put together this toolkit for, IO, for, for, for developers to be, able to, to be able to test their apps, test their devices, and to find these problems and, and fix them. Um, but I guess from a user perspective, um, we all have to insist that, that, develop, that SSL is used for all data transmission. Um, but then we also need to also insist that the mobile device manufacturers, the mobile de platform developers, you know, fix their UI. So it's more, it's more, it's more recognizable to us and, and other end users that what, what's, what's going on from a, from, a, from a secure data transmission standpoint. Uh, apps and devices that fail should always fail close when there's an SSL problem. So in that regard, our testing has revealed that in general they try to do that. That's a big improvement over the past years. Uh, and that's an encouraging note, I guess. But, uh, yeah. It re results in a uh, more, uh, a larger dependence on a single failure point, which hopefully people will continue to uh, consistently test to make sure it doesn't have problems that have occurred in the past. And I guess the one final piece, the gentleman that actually had that Samsung device, if you can meet us here, and that's, when, we were, when we were doing this, this talk, we knew that the iOS devices would be vulnerable because we released that advisory with, with Apple, um, and we were, we were hoping that we might find another device. Obviously, in our test lab, um, we didn't have you know, hundreds of flavors of devices to, to play with, and the gentleman with the, with the Samsung device, if you could meet us, we'd want to find a little more details about that device, and um, it, it may have, um, you may see an advisory come out very soon on, on that platform as well. So that's, that's our talk. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.